Hi, I'm Dr. Bharti, Infertility Specialist, Bharti Fertility Center, Mandavali. Today, my topic of discussion is going to be on ICSI or IVF. So, the main discussion here is going to be who undergoes ICSI and what are the things they are going to undergo during the ICSI process and what are the outcomes and what are the new techniques to enhance this. So, normally when a couple walks in, we take a detailed history from them. Like we ask them how many years they've been married, how is their regular, whether the cycles are regular, whether they're having any past medical history like thyroid, diabetes, or any th- any other disease, or whether they've undergone any surgeries, and if they're working, what is their work pattern, and you know what is the timing. The same thing for the male. I mean, where does he work? What's his age? And then whether he has previously done any semen analysis and what are the timing, whether he's a smoker, whether he's an alcohol. So we take a detailed history. First and foremost is we should feel we should make the couple feel very comfortable talking to us about whatever difficulties they have. Instead of, you know, mechanically asking them these questions, we should even give them some space and allow them to talk so that we can have a proper counselling. Once we have a proper counselling and, you know, when they discuss and then when we discuss, we come to know what is the problem. If they have previously undergone any treatments, we make sure we detailly look into all that and whatever has been recently done and whatever is very important, we make a mark of it. And then, suppose if there are a couple who have to fit into the category of ICSI, then what is the process? We explain to them. We explain to them the process. We take a detailed uh, uh, process of analysis of how they grew through this process and then we take a concern from them. They read the concern. We explain everything to them. So usually on day two or day three of the periods, the patient undergoes a blood test. Following the blood test, we do a scan for them to make a note of the antral follicle count. How many antral follicles they have in the right and the left ovary. Simultaneously, we even measure the endometrium to see what is the maximum range of endometrium which grows for this patient. So then based on their age, based on their AMH, based on the follicles and based on all these criteria, we decide upon what kind of injections do we, need, do we need to give them and what is the dosage we have to give to them. So we give these injections for 5 days and then again we do a blood test and scan. So that time we will know how many follicles have grown, what is the size and whether we need to increase the dose or keep the dosage of the injections to the same level. So averagely this injection goes from 10 to 12 days. So once when we know the follicle size has reached to around 18 mm, we think of triggering them. Triggering means we give injections for the follicles to mature so that at around 35 hours from the trigger, we do the egg retrieval. This egg retrieval process is done under anesthesia. So we give a short anesthesia, we sedate the patient and then through an aspiration needle, we collect all the follicle fluid and then we give it to the embryologist. The embryologist will tell us how many eggs he has got. After he's got the eggs, then what do we do is the male patient, the male gives the semen at the same day. For our own safety, we we freeze one sample of the semen so that if in case he has a difficulty or ejaculatory problem, he's not able to give on that day, then there should be no cumbersome. So we take the frozen sample and then we go for the ICSI. So what the embryologist does inside the lab is that he will first see the eggs, count it and then he will denude it. After denudation, he will see how many mature eggs are there. That is M2. That is M2 is called the mature egg. Sometimes we got M1 and GV. They are immature eggs. So we take into account of the M2 eggs. Those M2 eggs and with the sperm, we do the ICSI. So when we select the sperm, we select the sperm in higher magnification. The one which has a high motility, the one with a good morphology. Only such sperms are being selected. So for one egg and one sperm, the ICSI is being done. After the ICSI is being done, we check the embryos the next day to see whether there is a fertilization has occurred or not. After that, we check it on the day 3 and day 5. The day 5 is actually called the blastocyst. Usually, now the advanced technique is that doing a blastocyst transfer, which is a day 5 transfer. So, immediately we freeze the embryos. This is what happens during, during a normal egg collection process. So, after the egg collection, The patient can leave the hospital in 4 hours and she can continue her normal activity. Suppose in case if these eggs are not grown properly, embryos are not being grown properly, if you feel that they cannot be taken up to day 5, then in that case we freeze it on day 3. So we counsel the patient 
that so many embryos have been collected and they have been frozen and then we take a consent from them. So this is what naturally happens, normally happens during a, a collection process. So after that, suppose if there are patients who have already undergone HC and they have had failures, one or two failures, then we should not just straight away go in for another HC immediately. So we should rule out why, why is there a problem in them conceiving recurrent implantation failure or what is the problem, whether there is a problem in the quality of the egg, whether there is a problem in the sperm, or whether there is a problem for them to fertilize and take it forward or whether there is a problem in the endometrium or whether there is a problem in the cavity. You know, you should rule out what is what and where is the problem has to be ruled out. If there is a problem in the endometrium, there is a process called endometrial receptivity assay. In our hospital, basically we do this for patients who had previous failures where the egg is fine and the sperm has also been fine and the embryo has been literally fine and the endometrium has also been fine but still pregnancies don't happen. So this endometrial receptivity assay is like you prepare the endometrium just like how you prepare the endometrium before a transfer. Once when the endometrium is above 8 mm in a triple line pattern, we give them 5 days of progesterone and scratch and take the endometrium. It is done as an OPD process and then we send the sample. After sending the sample, we get an analysis that the optimum time of transfer is usually given. Suppose for some patients, after 5 days of progesterone, we usually transfer it, 5 days of progesterone and then we transfer it. For some, they will say transfer it 12 hours before, 12 hours later. So with this mark, we go ahead with the transfer. So there are evidences and there are studies which say that endometrial receptivity assay has been helpful in patients who have had an endometrial issue. That's the first thing. Second thing, if the endometrium is not growing properly, then again we have medicines and injections and then we can even do PRP for such patients to enhance the blood flow to the endometrium. This is another option we have which is available. And thirdly, what we can do is we can do a hysteroscopy to see if the cavity is fine, whether there is any septum, whether there is any polyp, or what is the problem, whether there is any other problem in the uterus, should always make sure that the uterus cavity is fine before going into a transfer. For male, we do opt a sperm DNA fragmentation to know the percentage of the DNA which is fragmented. There, there are three categories, normal, poor, very poor. So depending on that, we take a call. The how much of DNA frag if the DNA fragmentation is very high, then we will tell the patients to go for a TSA procedure or a PSA procedure. That is, the sperms are directly collected from the scrotum. So that gives a better fertilization than the sperms which is normally collected by a masturbation. So these are few newer techniques. And finally, we come to know that everything is fine, and then but the embryos is formed, but then genetically it is not good. Now we have the PGD where we take few cells, PGD and the PGS, we take few cells from the embryo, analyze it and then we study and tell them whether, the, whether there is any problem or not in the embryo. Of course it is expensive but definitely it is worth than having a negative IVF. So there are newer techniques so don't panic if you have had one failure, definitely consult a doctor and know about all these newer techniques and go for the next ICSI and have a successful pregnancy. Thank you.